Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Joyel. I'm the director of the Asheville Design Center, a proud program of Mountain True now. Um, <laughs> all right. And uh, I'm one of the organizers for the uh, Building Our Cities speaker series. Um, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, the crowds get larger and larger with every meeting, and I'm excited to, uh, to have you all here today. So we're, we're excited and thrilled to be able to offer this uh, series for free to the public. Uh, it is still a costly endeavor to get it done, uh, but we're dedicated to keeping it free. And in order to do that, we have a number of sponsors that have made that possible. I just want to acknowledge them here. Uh, for presenting sponsors, we have Explore Asheville Convention and Visitor Bureau, uh, Mosaic Community uh, Lifestyle Realty, and the Asheville Downtown Association. We also have support coming from the City of Asheville, Mountain True, Urban Three, Carlton Collins Architecture, Asheville Grown, Aloft Asheville Downtown, and Friction Shift. So thank you so much to our sponsors for making this available tonight. Uh, we appreciate their support. Uh, the format... The format for tonight will be a little bit different. Uh, typically, we have a presenter come in, and they will occupy a good 45 minutes with their presentation and take questions at the end. Uh, but tonight's speaker asked us to, to flip that around a little bit. Uh, Deborah will be giving a, a presentation of about 20 to 25 minutes. And then from there, she will be fielding uh, Q&A from, from uh, the audience. And, uh, and that will be unmoderated. She'll, she'll just kind of be picking you all. Uh, as you raise your hands. Since she is relatively new to town, uh, I'd ask that uh, you introduce yourself and maybe the neighborhood that you're from or what your connection is to Asheville. And, uh, and if you could try and keep your questions um, directed on a, like on, a, on a broader scale of interest to Asheville, that would be great. If, if it's a concern about maybe the pothole at the end of your road, um, I'm sure Deborah is, is eager to take care of that for you, but it might be might be better handled on the side. Or you could check out the Asheville app to get that done. Yeah. yeah. Someone, someone, yeah, there you go, that one. Um, all right, so, introduction. Uh, Deborah Campbell comes to Asheville by way of uh, the city of, of Charlotte, where she spent 20 years employed in many strategic roles, including her most recent position as assistant city manager. Uh, prior to joining uh, Charlotte City Manager's office, Deborah served as the city's planning director from 2004 to 2000. To 2014. Uh, in December of last year, she became Asheville's new city manager. And uh, she brings to the job over 30 years of experience in urban planning, uh, transit planning, and neighborhood revitalization. So please join me in a warm welcome for Deborah Campbell. Thanks so much. I think I just want to avoid those two bottom buttons. But okay. if you do press either of them, someone will jump up and help you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I was getting instructions. I'm technologically challenged, so I think I got it now. So um, good evening, and thank you all for, for being here. I'm, um, I'm humbled uh, that we got such a, such a large crowd. Um, I am as, it might be, it's this one. Set. My name is Deborah Campbell, and it is my pleasure to be uh, serving in the role as the city manager of Asheville. Um, just a little bit about what this program series is about. Um, cities determine their futures by the policies and practices they adopt. Um, that first bullet about featuring na national experts. I'm not sure why I am here because I'm not a national expert. And then that second bullet, host professionals from outside of the region. I'm not outside of the region either. But I'm going to do my best to share with you a little bit of some things that I've been um, engaged in in Charlotte. I, I cannot overlook um, 26 years of professional planning that I hope uh, possibly, I know uh, one of my council members is here, hopefully that was one of the reasons why they invited me to this, um, to this great community. So I'd like to start with um, one of my favorite um, cartoons, since we are talking about building our city. And so I'm just gonna, gonna read it for you just very quickly. We just got back from a trip 
do you have a, did you have a good time? Did you see anything interesting? All I saw were shopping centers and motels. Probably for Asheville, we should say hotels. <laughs> every town looks like every other town. It doesn't matter where you go, you've never left. I think that when people leave Asheville, they will remember that they came to Asheville. You cannot leave this city and not remember all of the experiences um, that you were uh, able to and, and partake of uh, with this community. But I think our challenge is, how do we grow in a manner that maintains Asheville's natural beauty, ingenuity, creativity, and sense of place? And so again, I said I was gonna start out with a, a couple of, of discussions about um, my prior background in, in Charlotte. So a lot of these slides, probably about 13 or 14, are gonna be you know, just some things that I did in Charlotte and hopefully some uh, may be applicable to how we can address some of the challenges that we have uh, in Asheville. And then I'm gonna kind of sum up with some things that we are doing um, in Asheville, and, um, and then I'm gonna present for maybe a, a call to action, uh, something that I think that it's extremely important, an issue um, that we uh, need to get really, really intentional and serious about addressing. And so this image is an image of um, the light rail line. Uh, the uh, people are running down uh, the rail trail, which is a trail that was built parallel to the light rail line um, in Charlotte. Um, this line opened in 2007, and I must say that it was probably one of the most proudest moments uh, of my professional career, because um, at the time, little old Charlotte, um, in I think the 2005 plan, which was actually done in 1985, <laughs> talked about building uh, a transit system in Charlotte. And so how many ever years you do the math, um, we were able to at least complete um, one line. And so when we're talking about building our city, or if we're talking about planning in general, or community development, or anything, uh, it's about intentionality. And in Charlotte, and I think also in Asheville, have a legacy of intentionality. I talked to you earlier about my favorite cartoon. This is my favorite quote. A city is not an accident, but the result of coherent visions and aims. We have to be intentional. We have to determine and decide who we're gonna be when we grow up. And once we get there, who are we gonna be as we evolve? And so, one of the um, most important part of the planning process is creating the vision. This vision is reflective of the broader city of, 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 of Charlotte. And you'll notice um, lots of words have been underlined. But I would uh, venture to say that there are two that I thought were the most important, choices and citizen involvement. If I had my druthers today in terms of recommending changes for that vision statement, um, instead of citizen, I would have said public involvement. I don't want to be politically, but that's how I feel. Um, some of the key characteristics based upon that vision, you know, kind of bring it to the ground, were those um, that you see on the screen. I'm not going to read all of them, but generally, it. It's features that every community desires and wants for its community to be walkable, to be connected, uh, to have a variety of different types of uses, um, to have smart transportation, uh, and ultimately um, quality architecture and design and quality, <clears throat> excuse me, quality of life. <clears throat> Based upon that vision, those uh, characteristics, we literally had to create the growth framework. Where do we actually on the ground um, enable these um, attributes to come to fruition? And so the strategy in Charlotte was to develop 
what we called a growth framework, centers, corridors, and wedges. Um, activity centers are the blue things that you see on the screen, blue kind of block-like things. Those were the major employment areas uh, in, in the city, and that middle one that you see is actually Charlotte's uh, center city, which we called um, Uptown. And then the quarters are these areas. These areas ultimately serve as the transit quarters. And then the areas in between are what we call wedges. Each one of these geographies has a certain type of recommended development pattern. Growth corridors, the most extensive and intensive type of development happens here because you have the infrastructure, which is transit, to help support it in a nodal manner, not strip, but in a nodal manner. Um, these areas here, centers, they're also an area for higher density or intensity development. And then the wedges generally are single family. It's not to say that you can't have a mixture of housing types, but not as intense or uh, developed um, the way that you would have in the centers or the corridors. Based on that growth framework, we would take that and through the area planning process for this area, I think this is the Catawba area, you would literally have those areas designated, for example, to um, be able to have parcel specific recommendations about both the character as well as the um, intensity of development. Again, center's corridors being the center, the framework, there's a theme here. When we have a comp plan, it is the fundamental context by which we do and frame lots of other types of policies. And so centers and corridors, when we look at some of these other um, strategies or plans that were done, again, the transit system plan, our bike plan, the Charlotte Walks, development ordinances, all of that is framed around that contextual, again, framework of centers, quarters, and wedges. They're actually in the process of updating um, their comprehensive plan, which hasn't been updated since um, the 1980s, and that process is under, underway now. The first phase of the process actually was an inventory that is called something like um, an equity assessment. And um, very, very, very interesting, um, but uh, currently um, underway, and I'm going to be very, very interested in seeing um, the results. Not me. Okay, thank you. Um, based on the plans, then there is a strategy for a strategic capital investments. This was, was actually kind of an experiment that we took. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a journey of, does our investments really have an impact? Do they make an impact? Do they have broader community impact? It was looking at <clears throat> where we were investing, kind of a little bit over here and a little bit way over there and a little bit way over there. Uh, and was, were we really truly having the kind of comprehensive holistic impact that we wanted to make? <clears throat> As a result of that, we did this analysis called a demand impact assessment. And most of it was how do we assess if we invest in a geography, what's the return on investment? What happens as a result of that investment? Uh, where are private sector investments being made? And can we leverage and say, possibly, you do a little bit of this, the public sector do a little bit of that, so that it enables us to do a little bit somewhere else? Um, I really think that um, the kind of planning initiative that TDA has initiated, this demand impact assessment would be ideal for us to bring that kind of thinking uh, to that process. One other that is near and dear to me because I 
I, I make no bones about it. I don't <coughs> apologize for it as well, that I am a neighborhood person. I'm a strong neighborhood advocate. This, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> explore, quality of life explorer, it started out as a neighborhood assessment tool. And what that tool did is actually identified and classified, categorized neighborhoods into fragile, threatened, or stable. And it literally gave a quality of life uh, characteristic, I was gonna say title, to that geography. I can't tell you how much we used that document to determine where we were going to invest, um, where the private sector, where banks, where nonprofits use that to, uh, to determine where they would uh, make investments. But also now the quality of life has um, kind of evolved out of being um, almost what we found it may have stigmatized some neighborhoods by giving them a title of being fragile. So now it, it simply is an inventory, quite frankly, of assets. And um, it's, a, it's a great tool. You can go online um, and, and find it. Um, <clears throat> also, again, looking at um, centers, corridors, and wedges, our neighborhood plans, we knew that public infrastructure was extremely important in terms of determining and supporting the type of land use pattern and our streets play a significant role in supporting what we want as um, a, a development pattern and, and land uses. So we created the urban street design guidelines and here you can see the street profile where we have designating obviously certain zones for different types of, of activities. Um, I don't think that that guy's an e-scooter, but it, you know, it <laughs> may be. Uh, complete communities. So if we have complete streets, we definitely need to have and think about um, complete communities and assessing what things within a quarter mile of neighborhoods <coughs> should communities have and trying to work from a land use planning perspective, from an economic development perspective, to ensure that the, these variety of things um, occur. Affordable housing, definitely an issue for, for Asheville. Um, the Housing Charlotte Framework, building and expanding access to opportunity through housing investments, um, and using regulatory tools, we called it incentive-based inclusionary housing, which essentially we would give density bonuses, whereby if you, for example, lived in, and literally this is policy, if you lived in a certain census tract where the value was, the value of the land was at a certain point, and the land was zoned residential, let's say at five dwelling units to the acre, a developer, if they built a certain number of units for, that were affordable, could get a density bonus without going through a rezoning. In single family and in multifamily. Um, and we included all of the things that you, you need to uh, still maintain and protect the character and fabric of existing communities. Um, so we, we had a, a, a number of things. We had density bonuses, single family, multifamily. We had fee waivers, uh, expedited review, duplexes were, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, allow, only allowed originally on um, corner lots, uh, but now they can go anywhere. Uh, and then accessory dwelling units, ADUs, are, are allowed in single family neighborhoods as well. Um, particularly for series like this, and as I started out earlier in terms of how we want to create our communities, is to make them memorable. And again, there's no doubt, once you come to Asheville, 
because I came a couple of times before I actually got a job here. Um, it is a memorable experience. And it's not just the scenic beauty. It's not just the mountains. It's, um, it's the people. It's the variety of people that walk up and down that street. And I know sometimes um, we are inconvenienced by some people who may be homeless or may be uh, whatever. Um, and in Charlotte, there was a similar, similar problem. It created what we call ambas an ambassador program where people would literally either volunteer or be paid to assist and help with the homeless issue by referring to um, services, um, getting the police if necessary, and do, just doing those things as um, a host of a community uh, would, would do. And so these are some of the things that we looked at, definitely um, guidelines for uh, residential development, public art, uh, this is the firebird, uh, and this monstrosity. Uh, instead of putting up a wall and screening it, because this is along the light rail line, which is a, basically an industrial area, we illuminated it uh, so that you could have the ambience of experiencing um, this without actually kind of knowing that all this was behind it. One of the things that I'm going to um, talk a lot about is around uh, equitable economic opportunities. Um, I, I don't think that you can focus so much on physical without an emphasis on social. It goes together. And particularly for Asheville, we've got to do better. Charlotte had the same challenge, and they are rising. I'm not going to say that they've, they've arrived, but they are doing some good things as it relates to um, equitable economic opportunities. And what this means is pretty simple. We need to figure out what are the things in our community that's going to lift pe people up and try to manage those things or mitigate or remove what holds them down. And that takes study, that takes analysis, that takes um, intentionality. So this effort leading on opportunity is the effort that was about two and a half years, created a document, created a nonprofit, and that nonprofit is now working with the city, the county, um, some of the um, key executives that are in Charlotte of Wells Fargo and Bank of America and all of the, of the banks to help fund initiatives um, related to uh, addressing the um, educational gap, or achievement gap, and um, workforce development and training and hiring and procurement in particular for uh, minority-owned businesses. So, Asheville. I think we have a legacy of intentionality as well. We are going to be, I hope, um, very intentional about addressing some of the, particularly the social issues that we are challenged with um, now. You know, we, we're doing really good in terms of, you know, all the plans <laughs> that we have. And I, I think I, I'm, I'm certain I've overlooked a couple, but uh, yeah, I was adding as, as late as about four o'clock. So, oh, God, I left, I left these off. Um, but this is the one that is the most current, which is your, our comprehensive plan for our future. And it creates and includes a vision for our city that. Um, City Council actually posed for the community. And I just want to read that first, almost not the whole sentence, but Asheville is a great place to live because we care about people. And so um, I'm hoping 
that what we are committed to is being not place-centric, but people-centric. And I think if we are people-centric, the place will get, it, it'll take care of itself, I promise you. And so it, um, I didn't read that entire vision statement for 2036, but these are the key themes. Equitable and diverse, well-planned, clean and healthy, quality affordable mm -hmm. housing, transportation and accessibility, a thriving economy, connected and engaged, financially resilient. Honestly, I think we can get there on almost all of these, but it is going to take, again, the intentionality. It is going to take us agreeing on maybe one vision rather than the multiple visions that we have out here by the chamber and this group and that group, and it's not, I'm not saying you can't have your own vision, but at some point, our collective effort has to add up to a common vision so that we're, <clears throat> so that we're all working to achieve the same common goal so that we can have the same collective um, impact. And so what's my role in this? These are the kind of the duties um, that I have, but for the most part, I think my role is really, particularly internally for my department, department heads, is to be a cheerleader, to say we can, we can do it. Uh, we've got lots of folks we have to respond to. Uh, about 90,000 of you all uh, call on us generally daily. And then the other 50,000, 50 to 60,000 that join us just to visit, um, all of you have, have needs. But again, um, I think my role is to, in addition to support the departments and the operations of city government, it is to help the mayor and councils uh, achieve their vision and their um, priorities. And so as I said, I think that we're going to do just fine addressing these issues. And it's not to say all these other issues aren't going to be hard. They aren't going to take all the collaborative efforts that are needed. They will. They're going to take a lot of hard discussions, especially kind of thriving economy. You know, um, I don't know if we can put all of our eggs in the consumer basket of tourism. I think we have got to truly think about how do we diversify and evolve um, this economy. <laughs> so that will be a challenge, and I know that we've got lots of smart people who uh, live in this community who are, are willing to roll up their sleeves and work on this. Um, transportation and accessibility, I know I know transit is broken. And I come from a city where, where I lived, I had three ex express bus routes and two local routes to choose from. And I lived in the suburbs. So I know we've got a lot to work on as it relates to transit. But if the city of Charlotte had to fund its transit system through general funds, it would not be. It just wouldn't happen. And so we've got to figure out how do we have a different kind of funding scenario for, um, for transit. So I've said all that. I think we can, we can get there, and especially with the, um, uh, our comprehensive plan, I think we'll, we'll do the well plan. Um, quality affordable housing, that's going to be, we're going to struggle, but we're going to, we're going to get there. So, Equitable and diverse is my biggest concern for, for Asheville, particularly for black and brown people, for minorities. And so um, my staff warned me, you've got all of these um, statistics and people are gonna say, where'd you get those statistics? So a, a lot of different sources, 
Um, I got them from the state of Black Asheville. I got them from our own um, Asheville Police Department as it relates to uh, policing initiatives, from Asheville City Schools as it relates to the schools, and I think there is something um, noted there. And um, I'm not going to read through all of these, but I would like to highlight just a couple. Um, that unemployment rates for blacks are twice the rates that should be of whites, so I apologize for that, uh, leaving that out. Um, household incomes for blacks is only $30,000 as compared to $42,333 in the city and $46,450 in the state. For black women, the median income is $14,843. 61% of single black women live below the poverty line. And for me, um, you see the school one, but while blacks represent 12% of the population in the past five years, 28% of all APD arrests were of black people. So we've got a lot of work to do. And what I'm hoping, ultimately, we are going to get to that vision statement of an equitable and diverse community. And equity is defined as when we, we know we've reached it, just and fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. <clears throat> racial equity is achieved when racial identity no longer predicts individual or group life outcomes and outcomes for all groups are improved. And so, not to say that we aren't working on this, and I know that a lot of you are probably from nonprofits that are just tirelessly working on this issue. But what that says to me is collectively, not individually, we got to work on this issue, taking tons of resources um, that are needed to address this issue. This issue is hard. It's people. It's their lives. And so I, 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 um, I think that conversations that we need to have, they're tough. They're hard around particularly race. We know this on the national scale, that these are hard conversations to have. And I don't think anybody is asking for a handout. I think they're asking for a hand up. And I know this community is ready um, to offer and extend its hand. So what are we doing from a city perspective? Doing a lot of things. And I'm not going to read through all of them, but um, the affordable housing initiatives that we have, we have an Asheville City School Equity Collaboration that's underway. I just attended, and I, I think Ms. Smith was there as well. We had a, a, a Black Town Hall uh, on Sunday talking about this achievement gap. So it's not like nobody wants to help, but somebody has to lead. And I'm not sure who that is. Uh, and it's not just on these issues, it's on all of those uh, social and, and economic issues. And then for us, we're in the process of recruiting a new chief of police. We had a, a, a different approach where we um, went out to the community, got input in terms of what are your expectations? What are the qualities and characteristics of a chief of police do you think um, we need in the city of Asheville? From that, we created the profile. Uh, we'll be having a meeting this, next, this upcoming Monday to talk about how we are going to use that profile uh, as part of the interview uh, process. And obviously, we've used it as part of the recruitment process. But <clears throat> if that police is not in tune with addressing these broader social and economic issues, it's going to be tough. They, they may, not, may not make the cut. And so I will conclude with, for me, I, I'm such a sappy person. I'm so sorry to bring this to you all. But this is it's, it's an abbreviated poem. Uh, and I just took the last verse uh, from, um, by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Um, success, to give of oneself, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child 
a guarding patch, or a redeemed social condition. To have played and laughed with enthusiasm and sung with exultation. To know that one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. Thank you. I think this is the time for questions, if you have any. If not, thank you so much. No, <laughs> God bless you. Hi. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I can talk really loud. Yes, um, I'm Christy Carter with Friction Shift and Traffic Planning and Design. And looking at the list of plans that we have as a city, um, and the many competing projects and things that we want to accomplish, our pattern is to underfund most things. And so I'm wondering if it's better, if you think it's better for us as a city to narrow down what we're focusing on and spend more money per project or kind of keep with a strategy of trying to fund all kinds of projects with probably not enough money. Um, that's, that's a great question and, and, and it's a little, it's kind of a tough one. It depends on um, if we have made a conscious and intentional effort to go to uh, lots of different type neighborhoods, um, I would say let's focus our efforts. Um, and, and, and I say that in terms of I don't want us to have a listing of priorities where only the affluent neighborhoods get the investment mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the others have to, you gotta wait because we gotta do all of these projects over here. So it's a balancing act, and, and, uh, but I would tend to want to focus, have the biggest impact. And that's not to say that we, um, you said cut costs or something, we like to say value engineer. Well, yes. <laughs> 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 right. <laughs> um, but I, I think that's probably a better uh, approach of truly scoping out first and foremost needs. And what I found, uh, and when I first came, I, I talked to my staff about when we go out to communities, we have a blank, sometimes, well, we have in the past, a blank piece of paper and say, what do you want? We can't afford to do that. We can't say, what do you want? We have to say, what do you need? What are our goals? What are we trying to accomplish? And then let's talk about how do we get there? What do we do in order to, to achieve it? So I think if we start by figuring out what are our goals? What are we trying to achieve? And what are the things that are absolutely necessary, and what are the amenities we can have? <coughs> yes. Yes. Do you want this? Uh, I think it's on. Um, my name is Steve Hendricks. I'm a member of the Asheville Tree Commission. And I really like a lot of the things that Charlotte has done. Trees Charlotte in the city, Urban Forestry Program, mm -hmm. done some wonderful things. And several of us visited them last year and got some details about what they're doing. And unfortunately, Asheville is not, not at that place. We've lost about 1,600 acres of our forest, urban forest, in the last 10 years. Uh, a lot of that's through development. It's kind of normal things getting denser, but some of that it's not really necessary to lose quite that much. And Charlotte's going through a program where they're trying to get back a lot of their um, forest cover in the city by planting about 15,000 trees a year in neighborhoods and on city property. Um, trees Charlotte Foundation has raised millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And I think we need a model like that here where we have those kind of approaches they have a kind of a green banking program, and that would really help with development, acceptance of development here as things get denser. Is there's some offset of green space or 
or green put back in the city it would really help, I think. And I, I have a planning background, so I'm interested in things fitting together and not being done piecemeal. Mm -hmm. So this is part of sustainability and the fact that we need the cooling effect of trees in the summer and we need the stormwater retention. Trees do a tremendous amount with that. We don't want to put more pipes in the ground unnecessarily to drain, to drain the city. We already have a shortage of, of storm, storm water drainage um, that we, um, we don't need to make it worse. And carbon sequestration, which is a big, big deal here with climate resilience. So, so just a few comments I would love to. <coughs> Thank, thank you so much for those for those comments, and that's probably one that I, I, I should have should have included because we actually um, provide a density bonus for tree preservation um, as well. Um, you said one thing that was really important, which was that um, the Tree Charlotte Initiative is generally private led. They raise the money and they go out to public housing <laughs> communities. And um, if you don't know, um, uh, Chancellor Cable, her brother, is actually started that, that initiative uh, in Charlotte. Uh, we served together in the Catawba Lands Conservancy Group and when he left there, that organization, he started the, the Charlotte Tree Group. Tree Charlotte. I think, um, particularly in a city like Asheville, just have such a significant role. But we've got to figure out specifically what that role is, depending upon the service um, that the nonprofit provides. I, I believe that um, there are ways that we can come together to identify your priorities, our priorities, and agree on, we're gonna have this kind of an impact related to this particular issue. Um, so I, I think that's how I would respond to that. Yes, ma'am. Which, I'm Celeste you okay? You know, I wish that I could say yes, and we did. We, we didn't. Um, this young lady up front said it's not only Charlotte. That um, it was throughout the country, sadly, uh, that that impact occurred, and it was under the guise of blight removal. And and and, and even just that terminology raises some concern, you know, gets me all worked up. Um, because some of these businesses, the homes, it wasn't blight, it was home, it was church, it was community, it was family. Um, but what I think um, the response should be is we cannot necessarily recreate the space, but we can work on the opportunity that has been foregone and so I'm, please don't think I'm talking about reparations or anything like that. I am talking about, we have got to get a better understanding around people who uh, aspire to own their business, to own their homes, like I showed a number of the programs that the city has, and try to encourage wealth building uh, for black and brown people. We just, we, we have to be intentional about it. Yes, Ashley. So 
I mean, I imagine, like you, you mentioned that there's, you don't know who's gonna lead, but that need for some common vision. And I imagine in your freshness, all the different places are positioning mm -hmm. themselves and revealing themselves to you. Are there places where you see some commonality or some willingness to kind of look in the same direction together coming from different factions in the city? I do. Um, and surprisingly, um, people have been, particularly with the uh, school equity collaboration, almost everybody has said, count me in. I mean, the Piedmont, not Piedmont, what's the uh, gas company here? Now, Duke is electric. That new one, that new one. The, I mean, even them, even the cable company has said, you know, we're, we're willing to help. Again, is this a role that the city takes the lead on? And I don't know. We've got to, we've got to figure out who has that sweet spot that the community will uh, respect, will trust, um, and that they have a collaborative spirit in nature, because uh, it has to be collaborative. And it has to be uh, one that respects um, the opinions of black and brown people, because sometimes they want, sometimes they want to lead. We want to lead, or at least be a part of the decision-making process about our lives. Can. And can, yes. Ooh, light. Yes, sir. Uh, would you like? Yes, I would. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Johnson. I'm a retired city planner, and I'm delighted to hear uh, what you said today. It's, it's very promising for all of us. Uh, one of the problems that we get concerned about in my group is that is the quality of design <laughs> in this city and the quality of urban design and urbanism here. We're getting a lot of new buildings, but the quality is pretty mediocre. And we have a great architectural tradition here, yeah. thanks to George Vanderbilt and the people he brought in and who stayed here. Uh, but that's diminishing in quality because well, a whole variety of reasons uh, and uh, having to do with the use of materials and sure. so on. There are some things we can do about that. One is design review, which is being used in cities mm -hmm. around the country. We don't do that here. We could, <laughs> Chapel Hill does it. What's your feeling about design review as a potential help to making sure this city is the kind of place we do remember? Uh, was that? <laughs> I was just responding to the to the laughing. Um, the the I, I think the design review process can be uh, positive if it is done in a timely manner, and if it is done with reasonable expectations. Uh, and by that I mean that if um, if it takes ten to twelve months to get through a development review process like New York, some communities in California, we're gonna, we're gonna potentially lose uh, opportunities. Um, so I think we have to be and have reasonable expectations. Um, but I, I definitely support a design review with uh, caveats of being timely having reasonable guidelines and expectations, and, and thirdly, the opportunity from either a regulatory perspective or enforcement perspective to ensure that what we review, what we uh, approve, actually gets built. I think there was somebody over here. Hi, my name is Alfred Williams. And I don't think so. <laughs> and I'm from the East End Valley Street Neighborhood Association. But I am also working on a committee to bring up more affordable housing within the city of Asheville. Now, my concern, I don't want to get sidetracked 
uh, because I feel like Asheville is a very, very expensive town. It is. And when you talk with uh, blacks, they know they cannot afford to buy a house within the city. So working on the affordable housing plan with community land trust, my question is, how do we help people with low income, you saw the low income in your presentation, how do we help them to build homes and neighborhoods? I don't want to say it's not going to happen, and I don't want to say we're going to give up on it, but that is a great concern of mine. How do we build affordable housing? I'm going to say for low wealth. Let me change it. Okay? Here in Asheville. Sure. Um, affordable housing is one of the most complicated types and forms of development. <coughs> If it were easy, it would be done. It would, you know, developers would do it. So it's these, these complicated capital stacks and it's a little bit from this pot and a little bit from that pot and a little bit from another pot. Uh, it's complicated. Uh, it takes time. And it is not one solution. It's we've got to look at regulatory. We've got to look at financial. We've got to look at uh, all, um, um, different types of housing, uh, not just the traditional kind of architecture that we have today. Uh, we've got to look at a number of things, a range of things in order to solve this problem. It is not going to be that silver bullet, that panacea that's going to solve the issue. We, we, um, I was fortunate enough to take a group um, to Charlotte to look at purpose-built community, which that community from birth to uh, senior living is in one development with a school, a daycare, all in one community. And it's modeled after a development in, um, in Atlanta. Um, but we, we, got exp we got inspired. We said, this is going to happen in Asheville, mm -hmm. and I think it can. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would you I'm like to Mike Figueroa. I'm a owner of Mosaic Realty, and I've got an urban planning background. I started urban planning in Asheville, and so I'm thrilled to have you as our city manager. Um, what do you think our role, uh, or the city's role, I live in the city, so our role of, um, of taking the helm on affordable housing? Uh, I also do development work, and I know hurdles involved. Um, and I also know that the city has the ability to build uh, not-for-profit and borrow money a lot more cheaply than private developers. And the city also has land. So what is this? Uh, do you see the city taking an active role in solving affordable housing? So um, we have taken an active role. And I, this is, I think, a limited menu. Home ownership down payment assistance program. Council just passed that, and it is six hundred. How much do we have? One point four million. Um, housing trust fund, use of city owned land, two cent. Yeah, we're 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 all in. Uh, it's the, I think the matter. The, I think the not the matter, but the challenge is: Do we have enough enough developers? that actually want to participate and partner. I don't know if we do. I haven't seen it yet. And through the regulatory process, we require it. Go ahead. So we, uh, Urban 3 had a consultant come in and talk about affordable housing. I was lucky enough to be a part of that a few, few months ago. Mm -hmm. And she said that the, the size of our solutions aren't sized to our problems. Um, and, you know. In, in terms of resources? <laughs> In terms of what we are committing to in resources, she said it's a it's a hundred million dollar problem, and we're putting a million dollars into it. Um, and if you look at you know the earlier slides that you know the the city is a culmination of your intentionality. Yeah. We're dealing with urban renewal and and roadway projects that just slice through the city. We've got some really deep challenges to cover, 
try to lock into the community. And I'm not sure private developers can fill that void. I, you're right. Um, but private developers can help fill that void. Nonprofits can help. Churches can help. I mean, it, it, like I said, there is no silver bullet for this issue. Um, it is the collective group that, that, that needs to come together um, to address, address this issue. Um, the difference in, say, in Asheville and a Charlotte is Charlotte is the second largest financial center in the country, and so therefore a Wells Fargo and a Bank of America can raise a hundred and BBT, BBNT, and some of the other banks, Ally, SunTrust, they can raise a hundred million dollars. That would solve our problem, right? So, um, yeah, we've got a we've got a lot of lot of work to do, uh, and it's not going to be easy, and it's going to be a grind. Um, but we can do it. We are Asheville, right? Right. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. I saw that she was getting ready to drop the mic on that. One. <laughs> <laughs> Thought I would get up here. Let's let's thank Deborah once again for a great presentation. So we have uh, we videoed uh, today's uh, talk, and we also have videoed uh, the previous one with Kimber Lanning, and uh, and have finally figured out how to get it up on YouTube. <laughs> so uh, so we will be doing that soon. We'll be posting uh, and embedding that on our uh, website on buildingourcity.org. Uh, that's also where you can go to find out about our next presentation. We haven't uh, nailed down the details yet, but we're aiming for August, and uh, and we'll be announcing that very shortly. Uh, so until then. Uh, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you again, Deborah, for a fantastic presentation. We wish you the best of luck and everything we can do to help you in your efforts. And, uh, and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.